Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and of course, top of the hour uh, on hour three on Thursdays, and of course, with emergency reports popping in any day of the week, we have, uh, I should say, Professor Lord Sterling Tim Alexander, who is a, a history professor, or a, a uh, arts and humanities professor that deals with military, geopolitical, and financial issues from a Christian point of view. Tim, we have some a- amazing stories. Today, of course, we have the Supreme Court judges saying that they can literally act as God and tell us that we have to buy insurance and it's literally a tax, this health care bill, which will destroy the economy and the taxes, meaning taxes on everything from sale of a home to whatever. We talked about this with, with Mike Velarde the other day. We also you have know, the uh, contempt of court. Uh, Dr. Bill, I've read the Constitution, and I didn't see anywhere in there, even remotely, where it says the United States government has the authority to require citizens to buy private health insurance. Well, I think that what we need to do is we need to start calling for Congress to do its job and remove judges from the Supreme Court bench when they do unconstitutional rulings like this. Well, I, I, I agree with that and felt that way for years. But the, the problem is that we live in a government that it only gives lip service to the Constitution anymore. You know, the insurance lobby wrote the Obamacare legislation, and it's not that we don't need reform, and it's not that people don't need coverage. Uh, the entire American health care system functions for the benefit of big pharma, the big insurance company uh, companies, and uh, you know uh, related uh, indust- uh, industries like the uh, equipment manufacturers uh, in uh, ma- medical equipment manufacturers and uh, hospitals and so forth. It does not benefit the public. And uh, you're a physician. I have lots of friends that are physicians, and I. I I don't know of any that would disagree with the statement that that the American health care system is terribly corrupt and it's all about money. And uh, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have made any steps to really solve that problem. And Obamacare is a scam, but the trouble is that what the Republicans, they don't have a solution. They just don't want to spend more money to, to make sure uninsured people get coverage. Uh, you know, if you go to uh, a doctor for a hangnail, uh, it, it could be 75 or 150 bucks unless he want, m- wants to make a really big deal out of it. He might send you to a surgeon and it might be three or four thousand. Your insurance might not cover but half of it. And I mean, that's insane. It literally, it, we are at the point of insanity with health care. Yeah. But it's, America has become, uh, and about a month ago I linked the story, America has become the first fourth world country. And what the person that dreamed that name up uh, meant by it is a fourth world country is a first world country that is collapsing and has an incredibly high level of corruption at the highest levels, political, financial, economic, and so forth. But the petty corruption that you see in a third world country, you know, cop pulls you over, you slip him 20 bucks or something, you don't have that, at least not yet. Uh, but you do have incredible corruption at, at the top, and that's what we have. The, the, the Congress, uh, other than a handful of individuals, are um, are absolutely horrific. And what was it Gerald Clementi said the other day? He called them... Um, Two, he called the two, 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 two bit, two bit politicians. Two bit freak show. Yeah, two bit freak a, show. It, all it is is a two bit freak show, and and quite frankly, I mean, you look at Obama, you look at uh, uh, the Republican candidate, and and most of the people in Congress are, are look at most foreign parliaments, and that's exactly what it is. It's a two bit freak show because they make sure that they get some of the most deviant personality types imaginable in office that they can blackmail and control. And uh, if if you actually look at these people with an open mind, they stand up, uh, you know, and it, they wouldn't even make a good used car salesman. Most of them are that obvious, but yet we, the, the mainstream media shells out the malarkey and BS, and they drape these people uh, in, 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 in a belief system. Like, And then all the, there's always, every two years or four years, some guy's going to ride into town on a white horse, and he's going to clean up Dodge. Sorry, Charlie, it doesn't work. We've got change with Obama, and things have changed for the worse. 
we're still uh, how many wars are we in who can tell me how many wars we're in right now i mean we still have troops in iraq we're uh, we've been in uh, afghanistan for what 11 years uh we're, we're uh, also have special forces in already in who knows and we're about to go into war in, in the middle east well we um, probably already have special forces in syria right now and we're actually teetering with nato making statements that we're going to have a war against syria when the russians have said you do this and, and Russia's policy, you said this the other day, Russia's policy <coughs> is not to do conventional war. If, if Turkey attacks Syria, Russia will nuke via Syria. Russia will nuke via Syria and Iran, Turkey. Well, uh, and there goes the whole world. Uh, now, uh, I have something to tell you. This is breaking news. King uh, Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, in an order that was top secret until it was uh, somebody leaked it, uh, <laughs> has issued a royal command placing the entire military and security apparatus of Saudi Arabia on high alert due to regional, uh, uh, quote-unquote, turbulence situation. So the, the Saudis are part of the Gulf Cooperative Council states that are financing the war on Syria. The war on Syria is a backdoor to a war on Iran and a regional war, war on uh, Lebanon. And, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia has already told Israel that they have overflight rights if they want to attack Syria or Iran. And uh, we are, each day we take another step on the road to regional general Middle East war, and another step to World War III, and another step to Armageddon. And you have to ask yourself, who benefits from this? I mean, I, in, with 21st century warfare, uh, advanced biologicals, global strategic thermonuclear warfare, scalar warfare, all this insane, insanely lethal uh, technology, who in the hell would benefit from a third world war? Now, yes, okay, maybe the globalists think they're going to use the third world war to bring in their new world order and all this stuff. New world order on what? A, a planet that's been destroyed? It doesn't I mean, even make sense, It makes no it? sense, and that's why I keep coming back to this, to this analysis that you can only understand what is happening from a spiritual dimension. In and, other words, and we, Kibono, Kibono, which is Latin for who benefits, right. who the benefits? only one that benefits is Satan, period. Humankind doesn't benefit, nations don't benefit, not even the Rothschilds bankers benefit, nobody but Satan, period. Well, and Satan, you know, is the father of all lies. And, and he, nobody is more fooled by him than those that are his, his minions that do his, his uh, bidding on a daily basis. And all the globalists, they're right in there uh, manipulating everything to get a global war, to get a regional war in the Middle East. And, you know, uh, it, if they think it's going to benefit them, they're beyond insane. They're blinder than the blindest blind man that ever walked the face of the earth. They can't see it, but that's what <clears throat> Satan does to you. And I mean, if people don't believe that, just look around you at, at, at human beings. Look at the guy who, who cheated on his wife and lost his wife and his kids and everything his own, or the woman that cheated on her husband and lost her, lost her, her good family and everything, are countless examples. In, in on, a, on a personal level, day in and day out, Satan uh, blinds people. Satan gets people to do stupid stuff that, that cost them an insane, you know, their whole life, basically. And why? Well, that's how Satan works, and we seem to be going down that road big time. We definitely are. When we come back, we'll go through some more details of these amazing stories, analysis of where we are in this crazy time where we have a contempt of, of Congress, we have the Supreme Court ruling for Obamacare, and the election rolls on. Back in a moment. Nine thousand people a year. I think it is one hundred seventy-nine thousand. Welcome back. And uh, yeah, when we have the Obamacare, we we had abortion coming back in Roe versus Wade. Uh, 
back in 1973. Now we have the Obamacare, now christened by this uh, demonic uh, Supreme Court. Uh, it means euthanasia on demand. It means that uh, Obama's death panels, as uh, Sarah Palin said, and people thought she was a fool. She was just taking advice from good advisors. It is death panels. And uh, under Obamacare, they're going to be determining who lives and dies. Well, Obama is known as probably the laziest president in living memory. He basically doesn't do much during the day. He props his feet up on, uh, on the furniture, uh, and uh, he watches a lot of sports. But the one thing he really, really is Johnny on the spot about and very good at is he is deciding who's going to be hit by our armed drone strikes, who's going to live or die. Obama seems to have a almost a pseudo uh, sexual uh, fantasy or something about he gets to decide who lives or dies personally. So this is the guy that's going to be setting up committees and panels to decide who will live or die. And that who is us here in America. If you're ill, there will be a government panel appointed by Obama that will decide whether you live or die. Gee, that doesn't sound like the American way to me. My ancestors have only been here since the late 1600s. Uh, so I think I probably know a little bit about the American way. Uh, my people have fought uh, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. And yet, there's nothing that I'm seeing in this Supreme Court ruling or the Obama administration that strikes me as being American. These guys have, have shredded the Constitution, shredded our values, and are destroying our economy and have gotten us into more wars than we can count. Uh, by the way, Turkey uh, is moving air defense systems as well as tanks uh, close to the Syrian border. Now, by moving their air defense missiles uh, very close, you know, like a mile or so from the Syrian border, what they're doing is they're expanding the umbrella of those missiles uh, well into Syrian territory. So if they make an incursion, whether it's an all-out invasion or it's an attempt to grab some land to quote, end quote, set up a, 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 a refuge uh, area for, for the Syrian people, uh, which is the biggest joke on earth because most Syrian people are strongly in favor of Assad, um, they, they're, they're positioning themselves to do that now. But and, I think uh, that I think Turkey is actually... Uh, acting as cannon fodder. What will happen oh, if yeah. NATO uses them? Turk the Turkish cities will be targeted. The Turkish troops in the southern Turkey near uh, uh, Erske, what's it called? I can't pronounce it properly. It's called uh, Erkan Skander or whatever, which is yeah, the yeah. Town, town, which is, which <laughs> is near... You're far better on that than me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a difficult one. You know, if you sit there, you can pronounce it. But what happens is the Turks are literally asking for trouble. They're not just dealing. They're not just dealing with Syria, which is a very formidable force. They're dealing with Russia. Do you really want to deal with Russia? Do you, are they crazy? Uh, you know what's well, wrong with again, the Turks? Satan blinds people. Satan, uh, Turkey wants to, this role. Or they're being told they can have this role that the Ottomans played of, of an empire, uh, and they were in charge basically of all the Muslims all the way up to Indonesia. Uh, the Sultan was the the uh, kind of like the combined emperor and pope, you know, and they want that role again. But uh, you have to remember the Russians have wanted a uh, deep water port on the Mediterranean um, for centuries, too. And, uh, I mean, we, <laughs> we're going down a road that is, is insane. Uh, and I, I, I know I keep using that word, but I don't know how else to describe it. And quite frankly, uh, it, it's, it's suicidal. It's worse. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, let's, put it, let's put it a new term. I'm going to call it, it is global omnicide, where everything dies. It's not just a nation dies, or people dies, or the army dies. It's everything dies. It's called yeah. global omnicide. Well, the, the, the Iranians, 21 years ago when the Soviet Union fell, they bought up as much of the technology as they could and brought in as many of the scientists that they could from, and I always mispronounce it, bio, 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 preparat. bio preparat. Okay. Uh, which was the, the Soviet Advanced Biological Warfare Program. 
And in 21 years, they've spent a lot of money and they've developed the stuff. And it virtually, you know, most countries that are into advanced biological warfare, that is recon, DNA, genetic engineering technology, they use it to create biotoxins, which are more persistent than even of the longest persistent chemical warfare agents. They're extraordinarily nasty. But you can also go the the doomsday route, and that is you create self-replicating viruses that once they're released, they just spread like wildfire through the population around the world, killing uh, viruses that we have no uh, real defense against, that we've never been exposed to, that are designed and engineered to kill people, but to spread very easy and to have a latent period, maybe, you know, 14 days or thereabouts, where you don't even realize you've got anything, but you're spreading it. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it's, it's, a hemor- uh, it's, it's a hemorrhagic fever or some other uh, mechanism, and you, and you bleed out or wh- what other, but you die. Uh, and and this, this is a mad, a mutually assured destruction global counterforce. And they have it. We know they have it. Uh, they can, uh, I'm sure they have terrorists in place waiting for uh, coded messages in the United States, Canada, all over Western Europe and the Middle East that can go to their freezers and pull out uh, some frozen viruses and atomize them in shopping centers, in, in movie theaters, you can have something that looks like a cell phone, and you got a little button you're pressing, and it atomizes. When you sneeze, you atomize the virus. And uh, two weeks later, people start dropping dead. And the first people, uh, or the second string that will, stru- will, will die, will be the nurses and the doctors because they won't have taken steps to, to keep themselves safe because they won't even know there's a virus out well, there. Uh, and there won't yeah, be they, one virus, there could be 50 or 100. Right, exactly, and that, that's the point is is the the swine flu, by the way, was reported, and I had some people say, write me recently, said, Dr. Deagle, you were wrong in your prophecy that you said that back in 2000, I think it was nine, that that, that flu that came out, I did actually a year or so before then, I said that it was going to be very, very bad, but it was just a foreshadow of something much worse. Well, they've now published that there were around almost 600,000 dead from that. It was 15 times worse. This is in the journal Lancet than previously you pro- predicted. And the number of dead is somewhere between 300,000 and 600,000 worldwide. It's probably even more than that, but it's at least 15 times more than they even published originally. When when these plagues are released, if there's a war started, it will be thousands of times worse than this. Thousands. We're talking yeah. about billions dead. Not just hundreds of thousands or even millions. We're talking about billions dead. And that is... Uh, I'm not exaggerating. And people say, oh, Dr. Deagle, you're exaggerating. I work with the FBI no, and CDC in Operation... I work with the FBI and CDC on Operation Top Off and Dark World, and we're doing war game simulations with the government. And I can tell you face-to-face meetings with these characters, they know that when these plagues are finally released of a biological war started, this will shut society down. We will enter the new world order with a mask on more assuredly than even with a gun to our head. And we have Chris Harris, our nuclear expert. And by the way, ENE News in Japan has now picked up our story, our protocols that we've been following for now over a year and a half almost. Uh, Chris, tell us about the latest what's going on now in terms of the dispute. The fact is you've made a very important prescient point that we do not have intact nuclear reactors. Some of the protocols that were previously devised were based on the idea we have intact reactors and we actually have a radioactive debris zone. And, in fact, the uh, the situation is multiple problems that continue to evolve at differential rates. The situation in reactor cooling pool number four is we have a leaking vessel. We have a, a problem with the seal. There's leaks around the, the wall. The walls are buckling. There's neutron annealing of the materials. They put a cap on the top that's so many tons. We now know that uh, just the popping of the corks of 1,545 fuel rod assembly uh, tubes will produce, according to the report that we posted a few weeks ago you gave me, between 80 and 300 times the radiation if only 10% of those pop. 
like a champagne bottle sitting in the tarmac in Phoenix Airport at 120 degrees. What we're looking at is reactor number one. The Taurus is showing super high radioactive water. The gauges in reactor two are moving in the same direction, even though they're supposed to be reported as broken. The area is so dangerous that they can't bring in any people in to properly service the, uh, the high-speed pumps to keep pumping highly radioactive water. And every day, over a 1,000 tons, they'll at least admit to, of highly radioactive water being pumped straight into the Pacific Ocean not including the venting of radioisotopes many miles and kilometers offshore and onshore onto the Isle of Honshu and off into the ocean floor bed where plumes of radiation are coming uh, through the, uh, the uh, Karoshi current, the Japanese current called the Black Current uh, that uh, comes to Alaska and North America and all the way down to the Baja California. This situation, and I continue to harass the people at uh, Senator Wyden's office, and if you're in Oregon, do call their office, because I've been calling Mary Gautro, who's his assistant, and saying, look, we need data. I just got off the phone this morning before the show to Dr. William Ray, and he also wants me to do a major presentation this October for the Academy uh, of, and, uh, of Environmental Medicine on the situation. I don't know if we have till October. I think we're going to have a burp of radiation this summer, and it doesn't mean it's the last burp either. A major explosion of radiation could come from any number of sources, but I think cooling pool number four is the major risk right now. And if 100% of the radiation is released, you've shown in this report by this nuclear expert that reviewed the amount of radiation that potentially could be released, it could be 3,000 times more radiation than released on March 11th last year. That would produce what I call acute radiation illness across the northern hemisphere. That's how serious this is. Yes, and uh, yeah, you're, you're right. The timing is going to be very crucial on this, and I, yeah. I like what you said about it's not going to be one shot deal and it's done. It's going to be a series. No, no, this, of, this is a, I call that's why I call it burps. It's like somebody with yeah, bad indigestion. Burp. The area is going to continue burping radiation for decades or centuries, and we have to have develop a policy. And we've laid down technologies. They can't get in there now. They're talking about removing the fuel rod assemblies, not in 2014 or 15, but this year. How are they going to do that unless they pop the cork on on advanced technology we have for deep space where we have radiation-proof robots, robots working on the end of cables, uh, coming in there and putting Kevlar spider silk. You can't put a sarcophagus of concrete around it. And that's why this idea of putting a cap literally on top of reactor cooling pool 4, which further stresses the structural integrity, is the stupidest damn thing I've ever heard. It's crazy. Yeah, if they were going to keep the debris out, I would have preferred at least a, a heavy grating, at least, you know, so that you could pour water into it. And right now you cannot, just in case you had to. Right. You know, even from an aerial spray. And uh, what you were discussing about um, uh, technology, how do you do this? Well, I, you know, as an engineer, being being around this for a really long time, to be honest with you, I really don't know. I, I don't, This is going to require a lot of people who probably are, hopefully, they're thinking about how to do it in the most effective manner and uh, it's certainly not going to be cheap and it's not going to be easy that's for sure and it's never been done before to this extent and to this you know to the, to the magnitude of what you're looking at an endeavor uh, you know it's going to require a lot of people putting their heads together on this because uh, there's no way that uh, you know just just a few people are going to come up with a real solid answer and that's going to work you know we can we can come up with all such certain kinds of, you know, use this robot and do this, but you have to plan for every contingency, especially in a structure that's in a state of, that's been compromised. So I don't really know how it's going to be, happen, but I do know that it needs to happen. Uh, unit 1 was interesting because they did send a camera down, they just sent you an article on that, and uh, they took some pictures of it, and what they, if there is the room called the Taurus, they call it the Taurus basement, well, you remember the big round donut? Yeah, that's the Taurus, you're talking about uh, reactor cool number 1, uh, reactor number 1, okay. right, the Taurus? Yes, that's correct, and they got a chance to take a look in there, and, uh, well, the basement part where the Taurus, the Taurus sits in a room, well, it's like a big, big round room, and, uh, it's not supposed to have any water in it, but it is, it is full of water. And, uh, you know, some, some conjecture, well, maybe it was part of the tsunami. Well, it's, I don't believe that's true because there are watertight doors way up above. That would have prevented it from filling from, from above from the tsunami. But there is highly radioactive. The words were a lethal dose of radiation in there. And if that were, that's got to come from only one place, and that comes from melted core. 
And so we do know if it's in the if it's in the basement of the tourist room, well, what that means is that the containment is compromised in Unit One, which well, we conjectured that uh, what, what it was, but this would be confirmation. And uh, the instruments. Well, were Chris, it hasn't on. gone through the floor that the the floor where the Taurus is, right? Well, you see, that's the thing. Now that would be inside yeah, the containment building itself. On the, you know, the, the technically, the Taurus is part of containment, an expansion of containment. Yeah. My guess is and a good I part would, of the corium is already gone southward toward the core of this man, of the, in the mantle of the Earth, and that it's yeah, probably it's somewhere not, between twenty and sixty meters below the re, the floor of the reactor. But that would be the China syndrome. On. At the bottom of that light bulb shaped object, which we call containment, you know, the dry well, actually, because now we're talking about the wet well. So I don't know what's going on in there. We, I, if, if everything's following the way accidents progress, then there has to be a core that's down into the bottom of the dry well, also. But we, just, we haven't taken a look yet, and I don't think anybody has had the opportunity or the, uh, the technique to do that. But finding such radiation from a, a radioactive material in the uh, Taurus room, which is an extension of containment, but it's but it's further out. You know, it's, a, it's like a concentric ring that's further out from the big light bulb shaped object. It means that there was a here's another burp again, bur burps of radiation coming out through the downcomers, and uh, perhaps even running alongside the. Uh, I, I can I can probably send you some pictures and all what what I believe. Where the where the uh, material entered the room is, but there are there are uh, it would have to be that there's cracks in the, in that in the downcomer tubes and it also in the uh, in the torus itself perhaps and it took some of the material from the core. Doesn't it doesn't have to be a lot of material either. That tells you how radioactive it is. So, what they're finding in the words were a lethal dose. You know, over a thousand rads. So, uh, their detectors were were picking that up. So if you're a human being and you're there for any length of time at all, minutes, you die, right? Yeah, yeah. That's 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 the that's a lethal acute dose lethal. Not even not chronic, but that's it. You got you know yeah. your minutes and you've exceeded your stay time. Wow. So well that well that means that there is significant damage there, and it also means that it's probably indicative of commensurately more significant damage inside the dry well, which we haven't had a chance to take a look at, and uh, it certainly it, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of your listeners. I mean, you know, we've been only talking about this for a while. It's just that it means that this, this particular accident has progressed you know, along the way accident, accident analysis would show it would when you have a station blackout. No pooling water, no electrical distribution system for any length of time. And other damage too to exacerbate it. So it's you know it's a horrendous type of a cleanup process. It's it's an impossible cleanup process without international cooperation. No move by the United Nations. No move by the U.S. government. No move by the IEEA, by the EPA, or any agency on any country, European or otherwise. Welcome back, and uh, Tim, let's go through some of these details, um, and uh, Chris, a lot of these reports are pretty shocking. I'm sure that our people listening, E&E &E News, if they, the fact they picked up our report indicates that not only are we showing up at the desk of Homeland Security and the IAEA, we're showing up at the, the desk of, of Interpol. We know that the government knows these things. They may even have jet aircraft that are doing radiation testing in the atmosphere over well, the Pacific not Ocean. About them. No, in fact, I'm getting stonewalled so far by, Governor, by Senator Wyden's office, who raised the red flag after he was shocked by the horror of what was going on in Fukushima, along with Senator Dianne Feinstein. But so far, I'm hitting no response whatsoever. I gave a proposal. I talked to Dr. William Ray earlier today, and I said, I recommend we have at least 100 aircraft commercial that they're just sucking the air in as they fly along and then having a real-time... <coughs> <coughs> GPS monitored, altitude monitored uh, data stream <coughs> that comes down to earth it counts for a minute 
and milliseconds per hour that'll tell us exactly what the plumes are and where they are. And it'll give us an idea to pick a model of how many knots these plumes are moving, what altitude, if they're 20 to 26,000 feet, and they're, let's say, so many uh, becquerels per cubic meter of air, we can estimate in terms of the radiation levels. We can do this, but we have no data. We have no data. And the fact that we have no data in the face of this disaster that's coming, and what I'm telling people is I know how to recognize and diagnose acute and or chronic radiation sickness. 99.99% of doctors in North America haven't got a frigging clue. And I do mean frigging clue. It's that sickening, and they need to know how to diagnose it. And here's this, the kinds of symptoms. People are going to start finding they get every infection possible. Their energy level is going to be gone. They're going to feel really anxious and feel like stressed. They're going to have symptoms of maybe uh, very upset bowels easily uh, develop diarrhea or constipation or abnormal bowel functions. They may find when they get cuts, they don't heal. They'll start getting sores in their skin or, or sores in their nose. They're going to have fall, things like their hair fall out and say, oh, gee, that's weird. What happened to my hair? <laughs> they're going to they're gonna go out in the sun and they're going to think they got a sunburn when actually they have a radiation burn because they've had an acute radiation cloud, bring a plume of radioisotopes, and they're now getting hit with high energy beta emission, gamma rays, and, and alpha particles. And they don't realize they've got acute on chronic radiation sickness because, according to Dr. Bernhoff, who was on last week, 100%, not 99%, not 80%, not 20%, 100% of every single patient he's tested for toxicity, every single one in their urine, 100% showed thorium in their urine in California. And he checked it with his other expert colleagues in other states across the United States, right to the East Coast, Northeast. Every single one of them is testing and finding thorium, a radioisotope from Fukushima, in their urine. Now, people need to grasp this, okay? We're not getting the, new, the blame brain media. You can be certain that Sanjay Gupta is not going to call Dr. Deagle up or Chris Harris and ask for our opinion. They're not going to go and force the EPA or the other lame-brained agencies of the government from doing data. And if they did have data, they're not going to certainly share with us to tell us, oh, by the way, flight XYZ is going to fly through a radiation plume and you're going to get 3,000 becquerels per cubic meter uh, in mid-flight at 20 to 26,000 feet where you're flying from Los Angeles to, say, Chicago. They're not going to tell you that. You're not going to tell you when you get off that plane, you're not just going to get the radiation from being at a higher altitude. You're going to get a radiation because you're going to fly through a jet stream carrying a massive dose of radiation that burped three days earlier at Fukushima Prefecture because we did nothing. That's what They're we're going to be tell facing. You it's like going, uh, getting uh, 100 uh, uh, CAT scans in a row. Right, which guarantees cancer. Now, one embedded particle of plutonium, uh, americium, all these other radioisotopes, one particle in the, in the tissue, one atom, <clears throat> can one nanoparticle will produce cancer. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking at a, a cauldron of death. Dr. Deagle and, and Chris, what this says to me is, the, and the fact that it's been, you know, what, uh, 14 months or something like that, uh, and, and the information is still being suppressed, and nothing substantial is being done uh, to really solve the problem. Well, they're what saying now it's too expensive. They can't even, uh, uh, TEPCO's made an announcement there. the cost of a billion people. Well, so TEPCO's already people, said that they can't, they don't, have a, they, they don't even have enough money to do nothing. Tepco said. Well, Japan does. The United States does. The world does. Uh, how about we don't uh, go to war against Iran and and, and Syria and spend the uh, couple trillion that it will cost us on uh, saving our lives from this mess? The, what this tells me is this is part of a globalist population reduction program. It's, a, it's the a, ancient ceremony. This is the year of the dragon. Uh, the uh, year of the dragon, where they plan on. Literally, this is part of the phase of World War III. World War III started in 9-11. The prelude Absolutely. was in Oklahoma City. On September 11th, 11 years ago, almost exactly, World War III started. The financial side, we talked about this was Black 9-11 with Mark Gaffney in the first hour on Monday. That program 
culminated in 2008 with the, the, the first what we call shattering of the economy. The current meltdown in Europe that's going on now, they're trying to make a federated Europe and they want to have a G20 world currency and a European Central Bank with the FDIC of Europe. This is not just in the FDIC of Europe. When Fitch and Moody's downregulated all these banks, including the five major U.S. banks, they're getting ready to pull the whole house down. This is the ancient ceremony of the Phoenix, Pahanuk, the ancient ceremony of the Sumerians. They are ready to destroy civilization and rebuild it on the ashes of the civilization to their own liking. That's what they're and trying see, to do. That's where the, the satanic lie comes in, that they can rebuild it. They can't rebuild it. Only the intervention of Jesus Christ returning will save what's left of the human race. Exactly. So, uh, so let's go some of, through some of these other points. Every U.S. nuclear plant is required to perform scientific uh, seismic walkdowns to identify and address degraded, non-conforming, or unanalyzed conditions and to verify current plant configuration with a current seismic licensing basis. The NRC, since we had JASCO, who was a strict rule maker and was actually pushing this, we have a new director there. What's coming out of this new director? Is she saying the same things JASCO is saying, or she's going to give a whitewash? with 75% of the new U.S. nuclear reactors sitting near fault lines, and all of them venting off radioactive tritium because we use old-style reactors rather than completely mothballing these and converting them to more advanced technology like pebble bed, thorium, fourth generation, and tokamak fusion reactors, which we do, by the way, have. This is literally in Warehouse 13, and they don't want to release these advanced reactors. The ones developed by Canada, the CANDU, are certainly a lot safer. We need to also have ways of converting the right waste, which we've had for 35 years, to solid nuclear waste, transporting in special rail cars to a depot site so deep under the ground. And even if they had, even if they had the, um, the deep mines that they were going to set up in, in Nevada, uh, to actually dispose of this, they need two of these deep mines just to deal with the current level of radioisotopes just in America, let alone around the world. And Japan, all these radioisotopes have been sitting there for 50 years. It's just insanity. Yeah, what's interesting about the... Uh, remember, we talked about the near-term task force, which was uh, in, was in, was uh, started, actually, after, I was going to say in bulk, after uh, about April of last year, so April 2011, and so the whole, the whole thing of that was to uh, figure out what actions needed to be done in the near term. And one of the well, actions, uh, recommended actions, first of all, first of all, I got to tell you that a lot of those that we talked about, even without knowing what, what the report said, we had already come up with a lot of these because they're common sense solutions. They're common sense. Well, and they also and didn't uh, do a re, 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 re review of the seismic activity around these areas, like in uh, the North Annan reactor that we went over the, in the last year that went down uh, because of a seismic activity that destroyed the reactor and made it so dangerous that it didn't even fit their own seismic standards for the reactor, so they couldn't boot it back up again. Uh, it's a good example that, that they're not testing anything. They don't have anything for extreme weather, earthquakes, tsunamis, water lines, even just flooding along the river, like a lot of these ones in the rivers uh, in, in the southwest United States where just the water line will come above the no intake nozzles for the diesel engine backups for the power if they have a station blackout. They don't even have that. Right. Well, what this report, we're going to talk about how to, how to do a real walk down to go ahead and see what... what seismic issues you would have in the planet. First of all, all this was supposed to have done, been done anyway to a certain degree because now if you remember, this all ties in because even, even prior to this we said now that we're places we thought were seismically quiet or not seismically quiet anymore, this had to happen and this is a very detailed uh, procedure on what to look for and how to look for it and it's going to take a lot of time and effort to be done. It needs to be done and it needs to be done right. Uh, guys, I, I just want to tell the viewers they can go to my site, Europe, do a Google search, Large Sterling Europe. At the top of the news, I've got the ENT news site and it has an audio uh, of uh, myself and Chris Harris on the New Dramatic Report June 14th talking about uh, uh, this whirlpool and number four fuel pod at the SEAL Terrace. It's amazing. Check out the live stream channel. We'll have more reports today.